Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to the IAEA webinar on international data flows and data protection, harnessing value and protecting values. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. And I'm delighted to be joined by our two distinguished panel uh, uh, speakers, Bruno Jen Carelli, head of the unit of information of international data flows and protection, and Una Fitzpatrick, Director of Technology Ireland. Unfortunately, our third speaker, Gwendolyn Delva Corfield, is unable to join us today. She's unwell. She's very disappointed that she can't be with us, and we wish her all the best. But we're left in very good hands here with Una and uh, Bruno. You're both very, very welcome. And thank you for being with us and giving up your time and out of your busy schedule. We appreciate that very much indeed. Bruno and Ula will speak to us for around 10 minutes, and then I'll go to questions and answers with you, our audience. You will see the Q&A function at the bottom of our screen. I'll come to your questions after our speakers have finished their presentations. As is usual, today's presentation is on the record. Please feel free to join us on Twitter, and our handle is at IIEA. Today's webinar is very timely. International data flows are seen to, as vital to Europe's economic success. Setting the right framework for data flows can have a high impact on our e economy by experts say 2030. A global survey undertaken here in Dublin by the law firm William Fly, Fry in June 2021 found that data regulation replaces tax rates as a top investment factor. The regulatory regime is the biggest driver for firms seeking to make data-related investments in the EU. At the same time, international data flows of personal data can present risks to the fundamental rights of European citizens. The interplay between privacy on the one hand and national security on the other is always a complex and difficult question. We have seen legal conflicts concerning data which can pose uncertainties for business. Schrems II judgment in July 2020 uh, clearly demonstrated that what we want to develop is an arrangement that is sustainable and which will deliver the legal certainty that all stakeholders require. Our, our distinguished speakers today uh, are central to this uh, debate and play an active part in it. Bruce Jen Corelli and Una Fitzpatrick will discuss how Europe can best promote the benefits of international data flows while promoting citizens' uh, fundamental rights. And our first speaker is Bruno Giancarelli. You're very welcome again. And indeed, as head of the International Data Flows and Protection uh, at the European Commission, you're at the heart of this debate. You, he is also deputy to the Director for Fundamental Rights uh, and the Rule of Law. Bruno is currently in charge of the negotiations on a successor arrangement to the EU US Privacy Shield. Previously, he ed, led the EU's Commission's work in the decisive phases of the legislative reform of EU data protection law and negotiations on transatlantic law enforcement areas, as well as the institutional negotiations with the European Parliament and the Council on data protection reforms, our GDPR and the Law Enforcement Directive. He has also led su successful negotiations of several data transfer arrangements, including the EU-Japan Mutual Adequacy Arrangement, creating the world's largest free and safe data flows. He co-leads the EU negotiations with the UK on all aspects relating to justice and consumers in the context of Brexit. Bruno, we look forward to your presentation and thank you very much again for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you to IIEA for, for the invitation. I'm very uh, pleased to, to be with you this afternoon. Um, so you have asked me to, to introduce this, this topic of, 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 of cross-border data flows. I, I will... Um, um, 
try to say a few introductory words, but also maybe the, the I guess the, the, the objective here is, is, is to leave as much time as possible to uh, to change and, and, and questions and, and I hope answers. Um, let me make a few points. Uh, first, and uh, you have already said it to a large extent, but at the risk of uh, stating the obvious, the importance of data flows is a inescapable fact in our interconnected world. Uh, in, data flows constitute an integral part of so many activities, from trade to cooperation between public authority or just uh, social interactions. Uh, the pandemic has only highlighted how critical the change of personal data are, including for ensuring the continuity of government and business operations, uh, developing cooperation in scientific research on diagnosis, treatments and vaccines, or just being able to uh, 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 to, uh, to to communicate, to talk to each other uh, as we do uh, uh, today uh, for this event. Uh, at the same time, the demand for the protection of personal data knows uh, no borders. There's a clear need in our digital world uh, for rules of the game uh, on the collection and use of data. Um, and this is notably reflected in the adoption of um, um, privacy legislation, modern privacy legislation, based on, on shared values and, and common principles in, in many countries around the world. This is a truly uh, a global trend, uh, running to mention just a few examples from uh, Chile to South Korea, from Brazil to Japan, from Kenya uh, uh, to Indonesia, or from California to Taiwan. And it was very, to give an example of, 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 such, a, of such trend, it was very interesting to, to see at the recent uh, uh, first uh, uh, ministerial forum of the EU India Pacific, uh, uh, in Indian Pacific uh, uh, communities. I think we are talking about a very large, um, a very large uh, geographic area. That um, one of the uh, document that was adopted uh, was a joint declaration precisely on on privacy and the protection of personal data. A quite detailed document that, apart from stressing uh, the importance. Of, of privacy uh, as, as a component of a human-centered approach to, uh, to the digital uh, transformation goes in quite uh, some details in what are those elements of convergence uh, between, between, our, between, our, between our systems. Uh, and that's quite remarkable in a world that tends to be fragmented where, where you often have uh, di differences, if not divergences, uh, between regulatory uh, systems. So against this background, importance of data flows, uh, uh, demand for uh, uh, standards and the common rules of the games. And more than ever before, uh, protecting privacy and, and, and facilitating data flows can and, and have to go hand in hand. As data has to move across border, uh, data protection cannot stop at the border. Uh, uh, protection should travel uh, uh, with uh, uh, the data. And that is why in the EU we believe that uh, developing uh, strong uh, privacy uh, safeguards and uh, promoting the free flow of data are not opposite objectives, uh, but uh, uh, complementary ones. Uh, this is reflected um, in our ambitious agenda on facilitating uh, trusted data transfers. For example, so as you have already recalled, two years ago, we have created uh, with Japan the world's uh, largest area of uh, free and safe data flows. Uh, we have recently concluded similar deals with the UK as a, a part, I would say, of the uh, post-Brexit relationship, but also with, with South Korea uh, uh, at the end of last year. We are currently in talks uh, with a number of other, other, other international partners, in particular in Asia and, and Latin America, on, on uh, so-called uh, adequacy uh, arrangements. Um, we are also working on a number of... Uh, of, of other tools, uh, the, the GDPR uh, has a quite broad uh, toolbox in terms of transfers uh, that goes from contractual tools to codes of conduct and uh, a certification mechanism. All of this based on this idea, again, that uh, to facilitate data flows, uh, 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 you, you, you need to ensure that uh, a, a, a certain uh, level of protection travels with the data. But again, this. This, we believe that this convergence that we're seeing, and, it, and I wouldn't have, wouldn't have said that even uh, only a few years ago that we're see, uh, seeing around the world, offers new, new opportunities uh, to facilitate uh, trusted data flows. Uh, in the same steel grip period, we are also increasingly working with uh, international, regional organizations 
uh, and regional organization to develop bridges between different privacy systems. That's also an interesting development that I want to mention, which is recent, in which, and it's interesting in terms of critical mass in, of network effect, that uh, this work on international data flows is no longer only uh, work that takes place at bilateral level between the EU and a third country, but that also can take place with in particular regional organizations in which, and again, that's another illustration of that conversion I was referring to, it tends uh, uh, to have a similar uh, transfer mechanism that we have and therefore uh, 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 working on bridging those uh, different uh, theirs and ours uh, uh, transfer mechanism is uh, I mean, offers a, a number of uh, interesting um, development and perspective. That's, for instance, what we are doing right now with ASEAN, the, 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 the uh, Association of Southeastern uh, uh, Asian countries, countries such as uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and, and many others. They have a system of what we call the model clauses. We have a system of model clauses for transfer, those clauses that, you can, that uh, commercial operators can, can introduce in, the, in, their, in, the, in their contracts. And, uh, and, and, and we are working on, on really on, 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 on the commonalities uh, between uh, their system of model close and our system of model close uh, to uh, uh, see uh, whether uh, we can, once again, uh, uh, bridge a system, which would of course easily, uh, meaning which significantly facilitate the life of companies that are active in, in both jurisdictions. And also it shows how, when a regional organization such as ASEAN develop a, a, a tool to facilitate transfers within its region, it can also uh, uh, contribute to uh, facilitate transfer between that region and the rest of the world, including the EU. I think you, you're going to see a lot uh, more of this uh, type of work in the coming month and the coming years, including with other areas uh, and other regions and other regional organizations in the world, I'm thinking, for instance, of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, Latin America. This commitment uh, uh, to uh, uh, data flows is also reflected in the approach we, we are taking in our trade negotiations at both the bilateral and, and multilateral level. Um, uh, for example, in the trade agreement, in the famous uh, trade and cooperation agreement we concluded with the UK, we included straightforward prohibition of, of data localization requirements. And we want to make clear, and I'm not saying that this is always very easy, that uh, genuine data protection on the one hand and digital protectionism on the other one are uh, two very different things. And, uh, and this approach uh, is one that we are systematically uh, uh, applying in all our trade negotiations. Uh, at the lateral level, we are now negotiating trade agreements with countries as different as Chile, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Tunisia, Indonesia, but also at the multilateral level or plurilateral level in the e-commerce negotiations in, in, in uh, uh, Geneva. And then, and I will finish on that, and I, I've left uh, probably uh, uh, the most exciting uh, piece for the end. If, it's of course impossible to talk about data flows uh, uh, without uh, 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 mentioning uh, uh, EU-US uh, uh, data flows, uh, transatlantic data flows. What I've tried to explain uh, 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 is that of course the world is, is bigger uh, than the EU-US relation and that, a, that there are a lot of, there are many opportunities uh, around the world that we're trying to to say and, and to build on, but of course, um, uh, uh, one cannot ignore uh, the significance of EU, uh, EU US data transfers. Uh, just to give you uh, an illustration of that, uh, uh, 50, there, there are 55% more data flows via transatlantic cables than over transpacific routes. And a large part of these flows are, of course, of, of personal data. You have, of course, already recalled uh, the Schrems uh, 2 uh, uh, judgment. Uh, uh, developing a success arrangement uh, to the uh, invalidated privacy shield is a, a priority, both in, in Brussels uh, and, 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 uh, and Washington. I can tell you that uh, 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 we are working and we are working very hard on this, uh, almost as, as, as we speak. Um, and um, uh, yes, those are certainly complex and sensitive issues uh, on, on, the, on the delicate balance, and that's delicate balancing act uh, for the US, for us, or for any uh, modern system between privacy on the one hand and, and national security. Uh, but we do believe there are possible solutions 
uh, and, uh, and we have in the past month in these negotiations uh, made a lot of progress uh, in, in developing indeed a, a sustainable, what we, we hope uh, uh, should and, and needs to be a sustainable arrangement and sustainable arrangement is a sustainable, is an arrangement that uh, 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 is compliant with the uh, requirements and the quite detailed requirements set by the Court of Justice, the highest court in the terms to uh, uh, judgment. We believe that developing a sustainable and a durable arrangement uh, in compliance with the judgment is in the mutual interest of the EU and the US. Is that's the only way to deliver stability and legal certainty to, to stakeholders uh, 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 on both sides of the Atlantic and, 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 uh, and an adequate protection uh, to, to, to our citizens. So as I say, I don't underestimate that the, the complexity of these issues. However, I believe that as like-minded partners, we should be able to find appropriate solution and principles that are cherished on both sides of the Atlantic. What are we talking here about? We're talking about access to court, enforceable individual rights, and limitations against excessive interference uh, uh, with, uh, with, with privacy. And it should be possible for the US and the EU to develop solution on these issues. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and as I said, we, are, we have made uh, significant progress in, in, in the last months and weeks, and we are now trying to, uh, uh, to build on that progress uh, to come to a successful uh, conclusion uh, of, uh, this, uh, of this negotiation. I actually do think that there should be more common ground to, to work on these issues today than even just a few years ago, including with the US, as we see that, that privacy is high on, on the US domestic agenda. And that brings me, and that will be my last, uh, the, the, my last uh, words in this not so short, actually, I realize, introduction. Uh, 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 that brings me to, to what I said at the beginning. Uh, convergence pays off in privacy. It, uh, it, 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 uh, it, uh, it, and it, it, it brings more protection uh, 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 to, the, to citizens when, when data, uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, 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 move around uh, the world. And it also uh, facilitates uh, 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 data, data flows, which means facilitating trade, which means uh, facilitating uh, cooperation uh, between public authorities in areas such as important as uh, law enforcement and security. Uh, but, and, and as I said, it also means uh, simply, but importantly, uh, uh, facilitating uh, uh, social uh, interactions. And as you can see, the, the Commission has a, a multifaceted uh, 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 agenda on these issues uh, where we are trying to, to work uh, on a number of different uh, instruments, uh, the pure GDPR uh, data protection instrument, but also uh, our trade instrument and, and, other, and, and other instruments we may have also trying to, to create more synergies uh, between these, these different tools. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the uh, uh, discussion questions uh, that we're trying to, to answer. Thank you very much, Bruno. I think you've shown clearly that although our, our focus has often been, uh, you know, on the US and, and the EU negotiations, that it is a global, a global phenomenon. But I, I was quite taken by what you said, protection should travel with data. And that's probably an underlying factor. But it, it is, as you've really clearly shown, a global issue. Data, you know, just doesn't stop at certain boundaries. Uh, and commend you on the, all the work you're doing in that area. And I must say, really pleased that you see seems so uh, optimistic. And uh, uh, how the you know the uh, negotiations are going. So thank you very much for that. I, I've just seen. I think committed and the optimism. I leave that for others, but certainly committed. But you need to be. You need to be optimistic, Bruno. Exactly. Right? Committed yeah. to the result. Yes. Exactly. That's that's you have to be if you're doing negotiations. And talking about optimism, um, we, we now see that uh, Gwendolyn um, Dubois-Corfield has joined us. So welcome, Gwendolyn. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to uh, uh, seeing you after Una's presentation. So Una, thank you very much for being with us. Um, Una Fitzpatrick is Director of Technology Ireland, the largest and most influential business organization representing Ireland's tech sector. She is vice chair of the Digital uh, Europe Brexit Task Force. In these roles, she is dealing with the issues that Bruno has raised from, you know, within a European context, and of course, from a business perspective. Una has spent 15 years working 
in the knowledge economy, a strong supporter of new pathways into the sector. She sits on the boards of directors of Fast Track into Technology, the Board of Biotechnology Programme in DCU, and the MSc Pro Management Programme in the Murford Business School. She works as an advocate both at national and international levels and works closely on the business issues with our national ministers in government as well as Irish MEPs. Over to you, Una. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Joyce, and, and thank you to the IEA for inviting me to enjoy the, uh, join this webinar. Um, as Joyce said, my name is Una Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of Technology Ireland. Um, our membership is made up of leading Irish-owned and FDI players in the Irish technology sector. I'm also a board member of Digital Europe, the European organisation that represents the digital technology industry, whose members include 61 major technology companies and 37 national trade associations. So forgive me, I may echo some of Bruno's points, but I'm delighted that we're mostly singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, so I'd like to begin my address by highlighting the value of data flows and I suppose the five key calls from Technology Ireland to policymakers. So trusted digital and data innovation, connectivity and international cooperation have proven critical to our economic and societal well-being throughout the pandemic and will be essential to the EU's future success and resilience. OECD research indicates that connectivity, data and digital tools enabled adaption and resilience during the pandemic, but highlights the ongoing need to ensure that these opportunities remain inclusive. The EU and its like-minded international partners share generational challenges, including economic resilience, the green transition, health and security. Greater connectivity and trusted digital and data innovation offer an opportunity to address these shared uh, generational challenges. For example, on economic resilience, data flows underpin modern economic activity. The OECD D recognized Europe and US as important global hubs for the import and export of digitally deliverable services. Europe and the US are seen as a fulcrum of global digital connectivity, being the two largest net exporters of digitally enabled services to the world. Data flows and, innov and innovation offers further opportunities for our industry, SMEs, and our developing ecosystem of startup and scale-ups. Data indicates 90% of EU-based companies from all economic sectors transfer data outside Europe, often to multiple countries, and that these transfers are predominantly used for business-to-business -business purposes. Recent research indicates that the EU would be better off by 2 trillion euro by 2030 by safeguarding data flows. However, in a potentially negative scenario where EU data governance and major trading partners somehow restrict data flows, Europe would potentially lose out on 1.3 trillion euro growth by 2030, potentially impacting all EU countries and reducing exports by 4% on average. These impacts would be cross-sectoral, affecting both large and small firms and potentially downstream services such as healthcare. On the green transition, it is clear that the green and digital transitions go hand in hand. And then moving to health, in its 2030 targets, the European Commission has set an EU-wide goal of 100% of patients having access to interoperable electronic health records. Digital and data innovation can be used to empower patients, improve health systems and support health care professionals. And finally, on security, we must safeguard for further digital opportunities for our governments, businesses, services and citizens. We should continue to develop our cybersecurity ecosystems, but not lose sight of the need to remain open to international cooperation with like-minded partners in identifying and strengthening capacities to address the evolving cyber threat landscape. Leveraging further secure data innovation and data-enabled trade while protecting rights is also critical if the EU and its like-minded partners are to achieve these ambitions. I mentioned that there were five key calls from Technology Ireland. The first being that Technology Ireland calls for an EU that leads an inclusive and innovative digital decade. The European single market is one of our greatest collective achievements. At 30 years old, it holds untapped potential that would come from further liberalisation, a re-energised services agenda, and the huge economic, societal, environmental and well-being gains of digital. Digital leadership is critical, not just in supporting Europe's green transition, but for Europe's inclusive economic recovery and future competitiveness too. Embracing further technological change presents both opportunities and challenges. While progress is being made, the EU must not be complacent. 
We can unlock the innovations of tomorrow with the environment and the rules we shape today. The EU must focus on policies which foster innovation, competitiveness and resilience. The second call is the reimagining of the EU single market for the future. Single market and digital single market harmonization should be prioritized in the wake of COVID-19. Existing market barriers must be addressed along with greater liberalization for trade and services. The third Technology Ireland call is for the EU to lead a digital decade that is open for business. Resist inward looking approaches to policy making in the open technological sovereignty agenda. Take a risk and evidence-based approach to enable AI innovation, adoption, development and investment. Prioritize a voluntary approach to data sharing with incentives, promote and facilitate cross-border data sharing and take an, an enabling approach to unlock further opportunities while avoiding forced data localization. Specifically regarding EU-US data flows, Technology Ireland continues to encourage the Commission and its US colleagues to reach swift agreement on a revised and resilient framework for EU-US data exchange, addressing privacy issues as well as the need of modern digitalized business. Safeguarding interna international data flows is important to both leveraging the potential of the Trade and Technology Council and unlocking further opportunities for all in a digital decade. Recent episodes have shown us that the common values shared by the US and the European Union are real and with practical consequences. When the focus is on cooperation, the EU thrives by benefiting from global partnerships with like-minded countries like the US. We understand that the EU and US negotiations are making progress and there is a potential for an agreement soon, which is hopefully, we think about time after more than 18 months without a clear and stable path for transatlantic data. While there is an updated Commission guidance on SCC's post trends 2, referred to as supplementary measures, members and data protection authorities across the EU member states regu regulators will still have to interpret the CJEU judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. So there will still be uncertainty, cost and lost opportunity until we get a new resilient bilateral framework. The core issue is that until a resilient overarching transatlantic frame framework is agreed, a significant regulatory burden and cost has moved on to the private sector. While standard contractual clauses undoubtedly play an important role, there is still room for uncertainty. During Brexit, SCCs were described as alternative safeguards until an adequacy decision was agreed. We encourage the EU and US authorities in their ongoing positive work to find a resilient overarching framework rather than to continue rather than continuing to rely solely on alternatives. Ireland should work with partners to support the European Commission in ongoing work with US colleagues, to work with OECD partners to deliver policy guidance on government access to personal data held by the private sector, safeguard international data transfers and enable further economic opportunity in Europe. Finally, by leveraging the Trade and Technology Council to coordinate approaches to key global trade, economic and technology issues to reduce the chance of regulatory barriers hindering the potential benefits that trade can bring. By developing shared solutions that enhance our digital capacities and shape the governance of the digital decade. The fourth Technology Ireland call is for trust safeguards to be part of further digital transformation. Facilitate digital innovation, products and services when completing the digital rules of the future, such as the digital services package, in which we call for legal certainty, proportionate obligations, clear and predictable criteria for the designation of gatekeepers and fair and efficient contestable markets. The fifth, you'd be glad to hear, Technology Ireland call is the creation of the right conditions to unlock future digital opportunities. Prioritise investments from the Recovery and Resilience Fund and ensure good governance to unlock Europe's 2030 ambitions. Work with like-minded partners to shape global st digital standards and enhance capacities, particularly in relation to the semiconductor shortages. I mentioned at the start that I'm a board member of Digital Europe and that Technology Ireland is the Irish National Trade Association that is part of its strong tech trade association network. A recent Digital Europe study carried out by Frontier Economics show how our policy decisions on international data transfers now have significant effects on job growth and jobs across the whole European economy by the end of the digital decade. This study looks ahead 10 years and envisages us two scenarios, one where we take the right regulatory path and another where we continue the current worrying trends towards data protectionism. The difference between the two is staggering. 
in the region of 2 trillion euro in potential growth. And it highlights how important data is to international trade, but also our broader digital decade goals. The study also shows that the decisions we make today will have a huge impact for many years to come. Restrictions on cross-border data flows affect companies of all sizes and sector. The EU manufacturing sector stands to lose the most in absolute value. Indeed, more than half of our total losses from data restrictions. Data transfers are not only a key aspect of international trade, the value of which we have attempted to capture in, in the research with Digital Europe, but we were crucial for economic activity more at large. For example, moving HR information from a subsidiary to a parent company, transferring health data to groundbreaking research, or simply being able to use the perfect application for the tasks you need to do. Hampering the data flows behind these business decisions has a negative impact on all companies' economic prospects. Europe stands at a crossroads. It can either set the right framework for data transfers and win the digital decade, or it can follow its current trend and move towards data protectionism and lose. The analysis shows that the consequences of these decisions will have a huge impact on exports, jobs and growth, and will ultimately define whether Europe can reach its ambitious industrial and digital goals. To conclude, the situation since the CJU ruling on the Schrems 2 case has created uncertainty for thousands of firms, large and small, across several sectors, who rely on legitimate safeguards to ensure, enable secure international data transfers at a time when we need to reboot our economy. Recent, recent data indicates 90% of EU-based companies from all economic sectors transfer data outside Europe, often to multiple countries, and that these transfers are predominantly used for business-to-business -business purposes. Specifically on EU-US data flows, Ireland should use its unique position as a bridge between the EU and US to try and expedite attempts to negotiate a new and long-lasting data transfer agreement. Technology Ireland encourages the EU and US authorities to swiftly conclude ongoing work to ensure a revised and resilient framework for EU-US data exchange, addressing privacy issues, as well as the needs of a modern digitalized business.